Good to see all of you today. Why don't we pray as we get started here. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this day that you have made, that you have uh, blessed us with. Thank you for the sunshine outside. Thank you for our time of worship that we've enjoyed already this morning. And thank you for these uh, few extra minutes now that we have to look back over the, chis- the, the history of the church, uh, the history of, of your people, of which we are a part. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if you were here two weeks ago, um, you remember we were talking about, uh, at the conclusion of our time, a couple of what we might categorize as pre-reformers, some people who came before Martin Luther and the other reformers in the 1500s um, and were pretty severely opposed but kind of uh, laid the groundwork, um, brought a number of the same concerns that the reformers did. Um, before Martin Luther and his contemporaries. And one of those pre-reformers was a man by the name of John Huss. He was a Bohemian priest who identified a number of issues uh, within the teaching and practice of the Catholic Church, Um, and he opposed those things um, rather uh, prominently, and for his trouble, he ended up getting uh, burned at the stake. Um, But prior to his death, you might remember, uh, he said something that has kind of uh, lived on And he said this, referring to himself, his last name means goose in Czech. He said, you may kill a weak goose, but more powerful birds, eagles and falcons, will come after me. And Martin Luther um, applied that statement to himself. There's a couple of versions of that statement. One of them, rather than referring to birds and eagles, just mentions a swan. And uh, Luther and some of his followers identified Luther as that swan. But if we... Uh, look at the version of the quote where uh, John Huss says, Bird, powerful birds, eagles, and falcons uh, were pointed to the fact that the Reformation was more than a one-man show. Okay? It was more than just a standoff between a pugnacious monk and a corrupt pope. It wasn't just one man, Luther, against the Catholic Church. No, it was a movement of God to bring different Christian leaders in different regions to similar conclusions. And if we want to kind of identify the main uh, points of the Reformation, they are this, that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. Salvation is not by works. It's not by ritual. It's by the grace of God alone. Also, that scripture is the supreme and final authority in matters of faith and life. And then finally, that God is sovereign in history and salvation. And so, of course, as we talked about last week, Martin Luther, if we could kind of identify one man with the Protestant Reformation, it would be him. Um, But Luther's work was confined basically to Germany, where he lived, at least in terms of its initial impact. Obviously, the impact has spread worldwide. Um, But today, we're going to be talking about a contemporary of Luther, someone who lived and worked around the same time as Luther, Uh, but not in Germany, and rather in the country today we know as Switzerland. Um, And his name is Ulrich Zwingli, and we're also going to talk about a second-generation reformer, someone who came after Luther and Zwingli, a man by the name of John Calvin. So about the same time that Luther was sort of in conflict with the Roman Catholic Church, there was a similar struggle going on about halfway between Rome and Wittenberg, where uh, Luther worked from primarily. And so I like maps. It helps me to kind of pinpoint where things happen. And so we have a map here of Europe. Uh, The yellow circle in the north, that's Wittenberg, Germany, where Luther lived and worked. The red circle in the south is is Rome, where the Catholic Church is headquartered. Uh, The blue circle there roughly between them is the city of Zurich in Switzerland, and that is where Zwingli did his work, Um, and uh, Calvin worked primarily uh, not too far from there in the city of Geneva, and we'll get to that later on this morning. Um, So Switzerland had some um, characteristics that made it a a fertile area for Reformation, that made Reformation able to prosper there, uh, made it a little more difficult for the Roman Catholic Church to come down on what they would have considered to be heresy. Um, And that is this, that 
Uh, Switzerland had relative political autonomy. Uh, they had a very highly skilled, well-armed military. And also, if you're familiar with the uh, topography of Switzerland, you know it's very mountainous, and that served as a very good defensive factor for the Swiss uh, that kept armies out of Switzerland. And so between their defensive forces and the defensive landscape, it was difficult for anything to be kind of imposed upon the Swiss by force. Um, and so that was a favorable factor for the Swiss Reformation. Go ahead, Bob. Sure. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, th so we're here at in the 1500s, early 1500s, um, basically 1,500 years since the inception of the church. Um, and by this point, there's a lot of issues within the church in terms of both practice and doctrine. Uh, the doctrine being taught by the church specifically in regards, or especially in regards to salvation, was not scriptural. Um, and the way that the church was conducting itself was not in line with scripture. And so the reformers and the pre-reformers, especially uh, beginning there, but also others at various points, um, but it's kind of coming to a head here in the 1500s, had identified those issues. Um, and so they're coming out now and saying, hey, look, the church is teaching this, that to be saved you have to do these works and you have to do these uh, actions. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're saved by the grace of God, through faith alone. It's not anything that we do. It's not anything that the church confers upon us. It's what God has done in Christ. And in addition to that, you know, the church, now church, not only are you teaching that, but you're also, um, in addition to just kind of general corruption, you're saying that people can buy the grace of God that's then conferred by the church. And that also is, is not in line with scripture. And that's, that's basic, that latter thing there is basically the indulgences that were being sold which is one of the key things that, that Luther um, struck on um, during his lifetime and, and others before him as well. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we have to kind of understand where this is coming from. Um, and so those issues that I mentioned were prevalent in, in Switzerland as well as in Germany uh, where Luther was. Um, so... Zwingli, like Luther, is kind of coming onto the scene, kind of um, stepping forward with some of those same concerns that, that Luther had. But Zwingli uh, came at it with a little bit of a different um, emphasis, let's say. Uh, Luther had a very individual focus. His question was, how can I be saved? And you remember when we talked about his life um, last week, just how, um, just how he was in anguish, basically, uh, for his whole life completely uncertain he was he was sort of aware of his own sinfulness and aware of the holiness of God and just could not see himself being justified and he just kept working and working and working trying to justify himself but he couldn't do it he recognized I can't do this and so he lived basically in extreme fear um, because he didn't know how to be saved he didn't know how he could have that security of salvation and of course then God in his mercy and grace revealed to Martin Luther as he studied scripture that salvation is not something that Luther or anybody else could earn. It is the gift of God. Um, so Luther had an individual focus based kind of on his own experience of that anguish of, of his inability to, to merit his own salvation. Zwingli came at it with a little bit more of a community focus. He wanted to answer the question, how can we be saved? So not really much of a difference of doctrine in terms of the doctrine of salvation, but a difference of emphasis. So who is Ulrich Zwingli? He was born in 1484. I believe that's within about a year of the birth of Martin Luther, so very much contemporaries. Uh, Ulrich Zwingli was ordained to the Catholic priesthood in 1506. As he studied scripture, uh, like Martin Luther, he concluded that the church was deeply corrupt and that the church's doctrine was incorrect in many areas. Um, and, and like Luther as well, he was influenced by John Wycliffe, John Huss, and uh, Erasmus, who we talked about last week, um, a significant uh, humanist scholar. So 
Zwingli, as he studied and was influenced by reading God's word, he sought to apply scripture as the supreme authority to his life and to the life of the church. He didn't want to use the church as a supreme authority. He wanted to use scripture as a supreme authority to um, to um, apply to his own life, how his life should go and how the church should operate and what it should teach. So as a priest on New Year's Day in 1519, he began a series of expositional sermons going through the New Testament. He began with Matthew and preached and began preaching through uh, through the New Testament, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And as he continued to focus on Scripture and continued to study Scripture and continued to preach it, he understood the tension between the doctrine taught in Scripture, what the Bible teaches, and what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. And so he recognized with that tension there, this is what I'm reading. I want Scripture to be my authority, so this is what I'm going to teach. But over here is what the Catholic Church is teaching, and it's not the same. He recognized the tension, and so he realized he could not stay in communion with the Catholic Church. So in 1520, uh, he renounced his salary from Rome, and in 1522, he resigned his office as priest uh, with the church. So he resigned that position, but he was immediately hired by the Zurich City Council as the city's official preacher. So he separated from the Catholic Church, but he was immediately basically rehired to the same job, essentially, um, by the city officials. Um, so here we see uh, another early example of congregationalism, um, the idea that the church um, authority, the church leaders, will be chosen by the congregation itself rather than appointed by some overseeing body. Um, and so by 1523... We see Zwingli and the city of Zurich as a whole finally breaking with Rome. So that, of course, didn't go over very well with the Catholic Church. And he sought to defend himself against the criticisms of the, the church hierarchy by calling a special town council meeting. And at that meeting, he presented 67 articles, 67 theological points that he composed to, to summarize his differences with Rome. So you remember... Last week we talked about Martin Luther's 95 theses, those 95 sort of points of contention that he nailed to uh, the church door. Well, here Zwingli has 67 points of contention uh, that he has with the Church of Rome that he presents at this council. So the council um, was made up of about 600 uh, people, and they uh, declared themselves to be a legitimate church council. Um, and there um, they challenged the small delegation that was sent by the local Roman Catholic bishop to refute any of Zwingli's points. Um, now the church authorities, the Catholic church authorities, were um, kind of appalled by this gathering, um, this gathering that had come together under the authority of Scripture alone, and they were appalled that this council uh, was claiming to be equal to a church council that was led um, by bishops appointed by the church. So the, the council here kind of claimed an authority that the Roman Catholic Church did not believe that it had, um, but the council says we're operating under the authority of scripture, and so therefore we are equal um, to any other council that you might put together. Um, so the, the result of the council was that they uh, issued a decisive verdict in Zwingli's favor against the charge of heresy, and this is known as the First Zurich Disputation. Uh, they produced, as well as, as, well as vindicating uh, Zwingli, they also produced the First Reformed Confession of Faith. So let's take a little bit closer look at Zwingli's doctrine. Um, so first of all, he confirmed the core doctrines of the Reformation, that salvation is by grace alone, that salvation is through faith alone, it's in Christ alone, um, based on Scripture alone, and it's to the glory of God alone. So there are kind of some core doctrines of the Reformation. Zwingli uh, taught all of those. Um, he also focused on the fundamental distinction between God and man, that divide separating the creator from the creation. Uh, he was especially concerned about idolatry, 
Uh, he saw that as the most fundamental and heinous sin that can be committed by humanity. In other words, ascribing to creatures what is due to the creator. So anytime we redirect our worship from God, it's going to something that he has created. And uh, Zwingli identified that as the most fundamental and serious sin. Um, and as Zwingli looked at the practice of the Catholic Church, he was appalled um, by, by what he saw there in terms of the supersti superstition associated with relics and icons. Um, and so he sought to expunge those things. So he not only preached against that sort of practice, but he also purged them uh, from the churches in Zurich. Uh, one uh, Catholic writer in a letter to the Holy Roman Empire wrote this. He said, the altars are destroyed and overthrown. The images of the saints and the paintings are burned or broken up and defaced. They no longer have churches, but rather stables. So the Catholic Church was pretty appalled by what uh, Zwingli was doing, but he was removing all of those icons and relics and images um, from the churches uh, with the intention of the focus of worship being on God above. He wanted Christian worship to focus on the transcendent living God in heaven and not focus on human creations or images. And that's um, a practice that we see um, going along with the Reformation throughout Europe where there's a removal of the images and icons from the churches. Um, again, with the intention of having the focus of the worshipers go to God rather than things that have been created uh, by men. So again, Zwingli was a contemporary of Luther, and obviously on the main points, they were very much uh, in sync. Um, however, there are some differences between them to note. Uh, one major difference occurred around the Lord's Supper. So Luther objected to the Roman Catholic practice of the Lord's Supper because he saw it as a work. Not So he saw it as a work towards salvation, which of course is contrary to to the true doctrine of salvation uh, by God's grace alone. So Luther wasn't really as concerned with the way the church was practicing the Lord's Supper on the basis of doctrine, but Zwingli did object uh, on the basis of doctrine. He believed that it was idolatrous um, and instead taught that the Lord's Supper is a symbol or a memorial. Um, but again, remember the Roman Catholic doctrine is um, that the the bread and the wine are, are literally the body and blood of Christ. Uh, Zwingli, rep, um, he uh, rejected that, and he said the Lord's Supper is a symbol and a memorial, but it's not the actual um, physical substance of Christ. Now, unfortunately, uh, that difference between Luther and Zwingli kind of drove a wedge between the two of them. They did meet with some hopes of working their differences out, but they were unable to do that, and uh, sadly, they lived out their lives uh, in enmity with one another. Um, despite their great agreement and the significant work that they both did for reforming the church, that one thing kind of stuck between, stuck between them, and uh, they weren't able to come to a resolution. Um, there's some other smaller but still significant points of difference uh, between Luther and Zwingli, uh, one of them being what could take or what could be a part of Christian worship gathering. So what are the components, what are the elements of a Christian worship service? Uh, Luther was an adherent of what we call today the normative principle. And basically that looks at scripture. It says, what does scripture command? That's what we're going to do. But if scripture is silent on something, you may include it or you may not. That is your choice. Um, Zwingli, on the other hand, uh, was an adherent of the regulative principle, which again looks at scripture, what does God say we sh must do, and that's what we will do, but it limits it to that. It says if scripture doesn't command it for the worship of God, then we will not do that as part of our worship. Um, so according to the regulative principle, uh, church gatherings should include only those practices that are mandated by scripture, those being prayer, scripture readings, confessions of faith, singings of hymns and songs, preaching of God's word, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. And, th and those will be the components of worship, uh, whereas Luther saw certainly those being components of worship, but we can add anything that is not prohibited by God. So that's a significant difference in terms of practice uh, within the 
uh, Reformed churches and the Lutheran church. Um, and the third point of difference is a different kind of understanding of the relationship between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. Um, so again, Luther's emphasis was kind of on an individual basis. How can I be saved? And Zwingli's was how can my people be saved? And so he saw kind of a more um, community uh, emphasis, or he had more of a community emphasis, and therefore um, allowed for a much closer relationship between church and state where the church and the civic community were almost united as a single body and the kingdom of God brought nearer to earth. That was his objective. He, he wrote this. He said, the Christian man is nothing else but a faithful and good citizen and the Christian city nothing other than the Christian church. So he kind of brought those two things together um, in the way that he um, saw the world. So Luther, um, he... He taught that only the magistrates, the civil authorities, could wield the sword um, to keep the peace, but not to defend the faith. Um, so in other words, the civil authorities can um, use their, their, um, their power to keep the peace, to um, you know, prevent and punish crime, but um, not to uh, maintain the purity of the church. Uh, Zwingli did not hold those reservations. Um, he and uh, actually he was killed um, as a result of wounds he sustained in a battle between the army of Zurich and Catholic forces that had come out to fight against him. Um, so those are some disagreements between uh, Luther and Zwingli. Uh, certainly things of secondary importance, um, but they were both clear on the gospel and both clear in the belief in the power of God's word to bring about reformation in the heart of his people. Um, so, again, Luther is the kind of the guy that we think of first if we're thinking of the Protestant Reformation, um, but Zwingli also has significant influence um, that is borne out to this day just as, as Luther did as well. God used both of them um, in a great way uh, within the history of the church. So, Luther and Zwingli, um, we can sort of identify as first-generation reformers. They were um, kind of at the forefront of this, of this movement, um, but they had influence on a number of Protestants that came after them, Protestants in England, um, but also uh, one that we'll talk about with the rest of our time today, and that is John Calvin. Um, Calvin was born a little bit after uh, Luther and Zwingli. He was born in France. Uh, from youth, he was a deeply religious, serious, and moral individual. And interestingly, his, his path is almost a mirror image of um, Martin Luther. So remember, Luther, his father wanted him to become a lawyer. So he was in, in the study of law when he um, had that, uh, he got caught in a thunderstorm and in fear for his life, he called out to St. Anne and promised that if he did not die, that he would become a monk. And of course, he survived, and so he became a monk. So he went from studying law to being a monk. Calvin, on the other hand, his father wanted him to study theology. However, his father got into a bit of a, uh, a, um, a falling out with the local bishop, and so he changed John's course from studying theology to studying law. So in the course of his study of the law, Calvin also studied classic works of philosophy and literature, and in that he was drawn to the Bible. And again, as he uh, studied um, scripture, as we see uh, with Luther, um, he experienced a sudden conversion. He says, God subdued my heart to teachableness. And as he looked at scripture, he, s he saw some of the same things that, that Luther and Zwingli did, and he developed some some Protestant sympathies, um, and for that, he came under the scrutiny of the Catholic king of France, and uh, Francis I ordered his arrest for heresy. Uh, in light of that, Calvin fled to a city in Switzerland um, called Basel. That's up there in the far north, the red dot. Um, Basel at this time was a haven for refugees, um, and here he published his most famous work, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, perhaps you've heard of that. Uh, he actually wrote it as a defense of his own position to the King of France, um, but it has continued to be in print since then and has um, benefited many people 
um, who have read it. So we usually refer to as Calvin's Institutes or the Institutes, but uh, just call your attention to this. The full name of his work is this, quite a mouthful. The Institute of the Christian Religion, containing almost the whole sum of piety and whatever it is necessary to know in the doctrine of salvation, a work very well worth reading by all persons zealous for piety and, late, and lately published a preface to the most Christian king of France in which this book is presented to him as a confession of faith. Uh, so quite a ver verbose title. Um, and you can probably understand why we don't usually refer to it by its full name. Um, but despite the lengthy title, his, his work was just about an instant bestseller. Um, and throughout his life, he uh, would revise and expand and republish uh, that work into what we would read today if we picked it up off the shelf. Um, so Calvin, again, uh, was a Frenchman, but he was now working in a German-speaking city, um, and so he wanted to get back to a French-speaking place, and he decided to move to Strasbourg, uh, which at the time was in France. Um, but to avoid being arrested uh, for... You know, he had this warrant out because he was considered a heretic. So to avoid arrest, he took a roundabout way that took him to the Swiss city of Geneva, just to stop over for the night. That's the yellow dot um, there in the uh, southwest, the very uh, corner, so to speak, of Switzerland. Uh, so he stopped there for the night, but he ended up staying for much, much longer. Um, while he was there, he was connected with another reformer, another Protestant preacher, William Farrell. Um, and he was, though he was only planning to stay there for a day or a night or so, um, Farrell tenaciously recruited him to stay, and he did end up staying uh, to, to work with and assist Farrell. Um, so working together there in the city of Geneva, the two men ended up often in conflict with the city government over whether the church was allowed to excommunicate unrepentant sinners. Um, so the two preachers wanted to have pure church membership, and they wanted to um, be able to use church discipline to ensure that. Um, but city leaders thought that discipline of that nature was too rigorous, and so they ended up kicking the two men out of the city in 1538. And at this point, finally, uh, Calvin did move to Strasbourg. Spent three years there. He got married, um, and uh, he became the father of her, of her two children. She was a widow. But after three years, the city of Geneva changed their mind, and they invited Calvin back. Uh, he was somewhat reluctant to do so, but he felt a uh, calling to go back, and that's what he did, and he actually spent the rest of his life there. So he had been uh, preached prior to being expelled from, from the city of Geneva. He had been preaching there uh, on a weekly basis. His first Sunday back, um, he got back up in the pulpit, and he just began preaching or resumed preaching just where he left off three years ago. Um, so he didn't go on any kind of a vindictive rant about, you know, you guys kicked me out of here, but now I'm back. You've accepted me back. It proves I'm right. Um, no, he didn't do any of that. He just went right back to Scripture, preaching through it just as he had done. Um, and in that, we see a witness to his own submission to the Word of God. So he spent 23 years in Geneva uh, the rest of his life. He maintained a rigorous preaching schedule. Uh, he, he pastored, he counseled, he taught. Uh, he corresponded with thousands of people through letter writing. He corresponded with emperors and kings. He also uh, corresponded with Protestants who had been imprisoned. Um, and he did all of this in the midst of some pretty significant physical suffering. He had a lot of illness, um, but he persevered nonetheless. Uh, and interestingly, he even preached his last sermon after being carried to the pulpit uh, on his bed. So, uh, uh, quite a tenure in the city of Geneva. He had significant influence there. Um, and under his influence, uh, every citizen was to be under the moral discipline of the church. Um, he sought to preserve the supremacy and the independence of the church. Um, and while he was there, the, the church and the city's civil authorities worked um, very closely together. Um, Calvin was not in city government, so to speak, but he was a very influential and even dominant figure in the city. Um, he influenced policy dealing with things like education and commerce, things even you know not directly connected to uh, the church. 
Under his uh, work, during his work in Geneva, the city became a haven for oppressed Protestants. It served as a training ground for the Reformation around Europe. Um, it was even a base for missions, not just to other places in Europe, but also to the New, new World. They even sent missionaries uh, to Brazil. Um, so a, a, a far reach for uh, this city in Switzerland. Now, um, as we look at the life of, of Calvin, uh, if you do any kind of study of it, you will probably find that he has some critics. And uh, one of the things that critics will point to is an incident involving a man named Michael uh, Servetus. Michael Servetus was a uh, Spaniard. Uh, he was a heretic. He denied the Trinity. Um, if you remember back in spring when we were talking about different heresies, uh, he was a modalist. So he rejected the Trinity and taught that there's one person who just manifests himself differently throughout history as a different person of the Trinity. So he was he was a heretic. Um, he was there was a warrant out for his arrest in France, and so he fled to Switzerland. He fled to Geneva, and when he arrived, uh, he was arrested. He was tried. He was convicted of heresy, and he was burned at the stake. A couple of things to to note, um, since this may be something that you come into contact or so something that you encounter. Uh, it was the city council and not Calvin that ordered the execution. Now. Calvin did argue for a less painful method of death. He argued that he should be beheaded instead of burned at the stake, um, but he did agree with the execution. Now, it's important to note that basically every other Christian in Europe at the time would be arguing for Servetus' execution, Catholic and Protestant both. Uh, remember, he had a warrant out in France, France being a Catholic uh, nation. Um, er at the time... Heretical beliefs were almost universally seen as threatening civil order. Right? People wondered, how could one be a good citizen while denying God's truth? So that was sort of the, um, the environment that this incident occurred in. And last week, as we looked at Luther, we talked about some sort of um, dark marks on his record. Um, and in the same way, you know, we certainly should recognize the failings of even the greatest reformers, even the greatest church leaders. And we have to acknowledge, and we should acknowledge uh, freely, that no one is infallible, that no one is, is without sin except for Christ. Right. So as we look back at these reformers, uh, other church leaders who have done great things for the church, great things for God, um, we should be grateful for their work, um, even as we recognize that they are not infallible. Um, and we should also recognize, as we look back, that we have the benefit of, in, in Calvin's case here, just about 400 years um, of, of, of time that has gone by where people have worked on these questions um, that were put before uh, Calvin and, and others in his time, right? So it's easy when we're in an environment where something like, where something wrong happens, and in our environment, it's easy to say that's wrong, you shouldn't do that, um, it's not so easy to say that's wrong, you shouldn't do that, when the environment is that no one is saying that. Um, that goes for church history, um, probably goes for history in general as well. So, that's some of Calvin's influence in Geneva, but Calvin's influence extends uh, beyond just his lifetime and just his city of residence. Um, we mentioned that Calvin is a second-generation reformer. If we think about Luther and Zwingli as first-generation reformers, uh, and sort of we could summarize their work into a sentence or two. Um, they recovered the gospel, and they broke decisively uh, with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, their successors, the second generation, including Calvin, uh, refined, systematized, and further implemented reforms uh, within the church. So what are some of the lasting influences of Calvin? We mentioned the Institutes. Um, it's widely recognized as the single most influential book of the Protestant Reformation. Calvin also wrote commentaries on just about every uh, book of the Bible that are still in use by many. And then, of course, uh, Calvinism, uh, which bears Calvin's name. Um, now, um, Calvinism is often described as focusing primarily on human sin and God's sovereignty in salvation. But when we look at Calvinism, Calvinism as a whole, Calvin's work as a whole, um, 
he was certainly profoundly concerned with declaring the whole counsel of God for the entire Christian life. And so we look at all of those things. Um, as we look back to the work of Luther, again, remember, he began with the question, what must I do to be saved? Calvin had kind of a, a base question, or two questions, really, and that was this, who am I and who is God? And in answering those questions, uh, Calvin agreed with Scripture and with uh, Augustine, the early church father, that man is by nature sinful and cannot earn his salvation. Uh, Calvin also taught that God is sovereign in salvation. And God's sovereignty points to his majesty and to his glory. He wrote this. He said, although God lacks nothing, still the principal aim he had in creating men was that his name might be glorified in them. And were this not so, what would become of the many evidences of Scripture which tell us that the sovereign aim of our salvation is the glory of God? So there we have it at the end of that quote there, that our salvation is for the glory of God. Um, and Calvin saw God's glory manifest most vividly in Christ's work in securing our salvation. He saw Christ as the only sufficient mediator between a holy God and sinful man. And if we kind of compare this to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, um, they had sort of pre the priests as the mediators between the people and God. Um, the people could not go to God without the priest. Um, the reformers in general, they said, no, that's not correct. We have a priesthood of saints. In other words, every believer has the same access to God um, and is not reliant upon anyone except for Christ. And Christ is necessary um, for, as a mediator between every believer and God. Um, so Calvin sees Christ alone as the sufficient mediator between a holy God and a sinful man. The only way that we can get to God is through Christ. Um, now, of course, the, you know, if we could kind of sum up Calvin in, in a word, maybe, and perhaps this is not fair to the extent of his work, um, is that of, of election for salvation, that God chooses whom he will save, um, and, and um, that's the only way that you can be saved is if God chooses you. So sometimes that doctrine is portrayed in a way as though, um, you know, those who are elect can have a sort of um, a smugness. They could be self-satisfied um, or arrogant or even complacent um, looking at, oh, well, God chose me. Like, I must be special. Um, but that that's obviously very incorrect. God does not choose anyone because of the merit of the individual. God just chooses um, by his own will. Um, however, holding, you know, maintaining that, uh, it's interesting Calvin especially focused, in terms of looking at the doctrine of election, he focused with a pastoral concern. He, he wanted to assure anxious Christians of God's absolute reliability in saving them. So remember, Luther was distraught. He was in anguish because he didn't know how to be saved. He, his whole life he was, before, before he was saved, he was, he was trying to work his way into uh, God's mercy. He was he was always fasting and depriving himself as a monk. Uh, he was almost constantly in confession. He would leave after hours in confession. He would come right back to something else he thought of. Um, he was just sort of in this, this constant state of turmoil because he was unsure. He was unsecure. Um, the, when we understand that God um, elects those whom he saves and that he is, uh, that, that election is effectual, that everyone who is elect will be saved. And if someone is elect, they cannot be lost. Um, there is a sense of security in that. Uh, we don't have to worry about, oh, God, can God actually save me? God, will God save me? No. If, if we are saved, then we are saved. And that is, um, we can have peace in that. Um, and if we kind of look at the life of Luther as an example, um, when he understood that salvation is the work of God and not himself, uh, his life completely turned around uh, where he had been in this kind of state of anguish before, uh, he was really a, a very joyful man um, going forward. He, and we talked about this last week. You know, he didn't, he didn't lose sight of his own sinfulness. 
he still understood that he was a sinful man um, and used some pretty, you know, kind of bold language even to describe it. Um, but he had joy and security in knowing that it wasn't him that was responsible for salvation because he couldn't save himself. It was God that saved him. So stepping back to Calvin here as we wrap up our time, um, Calvin, Calvin taught that those God elects whom he saves, and we cannot know for certain whom God has elected for salvation. But he identified three measures that provided helpful guidance for discerning who is likely to save. Uh, one, participation in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Two, an upright moral life. And three, a public profession of faith. So those are not things that save someone, but are good indicators of whether someone is saved. Also, kind of, again, comparing Calvin with Luther, uh, Luther focused especially on justification. How can I be saved? How can I be justified? Calvin also focused on sanctification, uh, the believer living a new and holy life, and God's work in that person to, um, to change them to be more like Christ. And Calvin identified the church as being key in this process by helping for sanctification and as a display to the world of God's glory in making a holy people. Uh, so Calvin, again, is tremendously influential. Um, we benefit greatly by his work, uh, the work of God through him. Um, by the time of his death, it was very clear that the Reformation was not just a passing fad um, or even a local disturbance, but was something uh, that would continue uh, with, with worldwide impact. Um, the recovery of the gospel was not confined to to Wittenberg, to Zurich, to Geneva, um, but extended, has extended the world over. Um, so the Reformation spread throughout Europe, uh, was sometimes accepted, in some places it was accepted, in other places it was persecuted, um, but within decades, uh, Reformed or Lutheran churches predominated in Switzerland, in Germany, in Scandinavia, the Netherlands, parts of France, um, and Great Britain. So. Um, next week, we're going to be turning our attention to Great Britain and the Reformation uh, in that region of the world. Um, and I've done a pretty good job of getting us wrapped up at, at uh, quarter of. But does anybody have any questions? I know I'm throwing a lot out every week here, trying to cover as much as we can. Um, so if anybody has any questions, any clarification, um, please let me know. And if you think of a question later, don't hesitate to come up and ask me afterwards or um, get in contact with me otherwise or bring it for next week. Um, all those things are great. All right, let's, let's pray to close our time. Heavenly Father, thank you again for our time this morning and a look back over your faithfulness uh, throughout the centuries um, and just the work that you have done um, through your people. And as we continue to look at the Reformation today, we thank you uh, for, for what you have done to uh, ensure that the gospel continues to be taught today. Thank you for the uh, work of um, many brave men, many of them uh, who we don't know, women as well, um, who stood uh, for the truth, even in the face of significant opposition. Thank you for the um, many blessings that we reap uh, from that. Uh, thank you for your good gifts to us. I pray that you will help us to be faithful looking forward, uh, even, that even as we have been looking backward. Uh, please help us to to serve you, to, uh, to know the truth, to look to scripture, to look to your word for the truth, and to, to stand on that. We thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.